Thank you so much. I think you are very tired. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, I try to summarize my uh, presentation. Uh, how, how long uh, my presentation can go on? 15. 15. Okay. <laughs> okay the less, than, less than 15, no problem. Okay. <laughs> Uh, the title of the presentation is uh, Exchange of Philosophical and Theological Thoughts Between Persian and Andalusian Scholars. Uh, before I enter the subject, I want to just uh, give some explanation about the Persia. When we say Persian, uh, what I mean by Persians. Uh, the blue one, yeah. the blue one is during Achaemenid uh, period. The, this is the map of Persia. Uh, and the, that one is before. The brown one. Okay. The brown one is uh, before Islam. Mm. So if you compare these two maps, uh, there is not much difference in the territory. So uh, in fact, when we compare, there were some uh, period that the map of Persia uh, is a little changed, but in general, Mostly, the territory was almost the same. And uh, since it was a long time, uh, it created certain cultural territory. So today, when I am talking about the Persia, that means Persian territory or Persian cultural area, not only a geographical area. Uh, that means today, for example, uh, mostly the, because Iran is the center and uh, in recent history they have changed during the first Pahlavi they have changed the name of Persia to Iran and normally because Iran was the center of this uh, map so it, uh, repre uh, it represented the Persia in history but anyhow when we say Persia it is larger area that means cultural area, we are talking about the cultural area. And uh, culturally, these areas uh, were un under the certain culture. They had same, for example, uh, celebrations and same uh, functions sometimes. In fact, we have in this region, we had many cultures, many tribes, many uh, languages, uh, including Arabic, Hindi, and many languages, because it was the emperor. It was not only one language or one nation. When we say Persia, because uh, the link language of the area was Persian, because Persian was like a today's English. It was a link language. Even uh, when we talk about the uh, Persian as a language, even today if you go in India, the Persian is not uh, teach as a foreign language. It is part of uh, traditional language of uh, India. So it is a link, it was a link language. Even after the British uh, came to India for about 100 years, they tried to learn Persian as a link language. So today also you can see in India, they have various uh, language. Even they don't use uh, Hindi as a link language. Though Hindi is the, uh, their own language, but today they use English as a link language. So when we are talking about Persian, that means it is a uh, link language, which uh, many places were talking in this language 
until the colonial times. So uh, first of all, I wanted to just explain when we are talking about the Persian, that means as a cultural area. And this is the east of Mediterranean, and the uh, rest of the Mediterranean is including the uh, uh, North Africa, and also the far west uh, of the Mediterranean region. That means like uh, Morocco and Andalusia. Uh, and Andalusia. Okay, so uh, first of all, I wanted to mention what I mean by Persian. That means east part of the Mediterranean. If you see this is the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea, the east part. In fact, when we, in the history, we are studying about the east Mediterranean, that means uh, it includes also uh, from, it includes also Egypt and also uh, Libya. S but the rest of the uh, North Africa in the history of Islam or in the history, they know it, for example, Tunisia, Algeria, Maghreb, and Andalusia, they call them Al Maghreb Al Aqsa. Mm -hmm. That means the far west of Mediterranean Sea. So Andalusia is uh, far west of this region. When Islam came, in fact, uh, first the Iranian Empire or the Persian <coughs> Empire collapsed. And uh, it was a very large area and vast area, which I just showed that uh, many area you can see even Turkey today, and you can see this is the uh, east of Mediterranean Sea. So many area of the eastern side of the Mediterranean is uh, Persian territory at that time. When Islam came and the Persian Empire collapsed, so the vast area of the empire came under the control of Muslims. And then during the, this area mostly uh, 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 conquered by the second and third caliph. But uh, during the rest of the period, for example, North Africa, to uh, um, to uh, to Andalusia mostly is conquered during the Amavid period, Umayyad period. So it was a really within almost one less than one century. It was a rapid change and development in culture, in belief, in everything. It was a one of the important social, cultural, and religious uh, change and development in the region. Many Muslim scholars, after they conquered the North Africa and also Andalusia, many Muslim scholars uh, came to Andalusia and North Africa, uh, and also many people who converted newly to Islam, or those people who migrated to uh, Andalusia and North Africa, they came to learn about Islam in the eastern part of the uh, Mediterranean Sea. So mostly Persian uh, cultural area, which I explained. So one thing that it is important to mention Islam and Quran recommend, strongly recommend Muslims to go to the central uh, uh, educational uh, uh, education for the Islamic education to go to the center and learn and come back. Uh, it's uh, the Quran encourage Muslims 
to go and learn Islam from the uh, educational uh, madrasas or mosques which were popular everywhere. And even during the uh, Omega time, uh, even the government used to send some people to preach Islams, and they have also built many mosques in different areas. So, madrasas and mosques were also active wherever they have conquered. So, uh, other than that, one thing that was very interesting uh, for the Muslim of in the West and also Andalusia, one thing was very important for them that they used to come every year to Mecca. On the way to the Mecca, they used to go to uh, Egypt because Egypt also was uh, very active in the education. Uh, many also people for some time settled in the uh, Egypt to learn about Islam, but mostly also people go to other city uh, in Baghdad, Isfahan, Nishabur, Harad, and these places to uh, to learn Islam. At the beginning, mostly Muslim were concentrating on uh, learning. Quran, the science of Quran, and also learn about the Hadith. Mostly they were uh, cautious to learn about Quran and Hadith. But later on, because of the um, various interpretations, new ideas and new schools of thought came to existence. For example, uh, if by I want to classify these few uh, schools which emerged. It is one was an Quran and, uh, and Hadith, Quran and Sunnah at the beginning. It was one current of the thought. And the second was Sufism after that, which was, uh, which was the second movement. And the third movement was philosophy and theology, which theology is uh, uh, when I say it's philosophy and theology, that means the theology which use philosophy to uh, justify Islamic belief. So these four currents, in fact, were very popular little by little. Quran and Hadith, one movement, Sufism, and philosophy and theology. These are the few current Persia which I explained this is the first movement which I explained that the Hadith advocates and those people who were very cautious to collect Hadiths this was a kind of movement until they produce the large Hadith book like Sahih Bukhari like um, Sahih Muslims and other Sahah so uh, before that, mostly people used to go and collect and listen to the directly lessons, the hadith and the uh, traditions from Prophet Muhammad orally. That means directly from the different people until they came to collect the uh, original book in hadith like uh, Sayyid Bukhari and Sayyid Muslim for example you can see that uh, the Persian uh, area the Persian area was so active that although their language was not Arabic they were so uh, keen to learn uh, to, to learn Arabic and also to learn Quran and hadith mm -hmm. and for example Bukhari is the Sahih Bukhari is collected by Persians because he is from Kazakhstan today. So uh, that means the first important books in Hadith 
produced by Persian in Persian areas. Like for example, Nishabur, that means the Muslim at Nishaburi. It's in, uh, today it's Nishaburi in Iran. So you can see that these areas were very popular. The others, for example, Qazvin or today's Sistan, which is uh, the area between Iran and, uh, and Pakistan. So these areas were very active and their madrasas were very active. Though they were not Persian, uh, but their, uh, their language was not Arabic, but uh, they were keen to learn Islam, Quran, and Hadith. So at the first movement, they have learned uh, Hadith, mostly, and Quran. And these people also, mostly, later on, in this movement was, uh, was against the other movement. That means they were against using uh, the uh, philosophical uh, and also rational method to explain Islam and the uh, belief in Islam. So they were not agree with the philosophy and they were not agree with the rational use of uh, <coughs> uh, rash, uh, 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 rational method to explain the Quran and Hadith. And they were also, they were, not, uh, they were not agree with Kalam, that means the theology, because in theology they try to use uh, rational methods. So normally the Hadith advocates forbidden the uh, philosophy and, uh, and theology which is based on the rational method. These are the uh, books in uh, Hadith, which today we can also we have, because these are the main source of uh, Islamic studies. Philosophy of Muslim or Islamic philosophy, and sometimes we can see also they use Arabic philosophy. <coughs> so, uh, in fact, I, I, I am more comfortable to use philosophy of Muslim because some Muslims are not agree with mm -hmm. philosophy. So we can say Muslim, uh, not Islamic philosophy, I use Muslim philosophies. Because uh, some Muslims are not uh, agree and comfortable with using Islamic philosophy. As I told you, philosophy according to them is forbidden. So Islamic philosophy or Muslim, uh, or philosophy of Muslims, uh, is a, in general, is a discipline, is a major, which talks about the existence, existence of God, existence and nature and the man and the relation between nature and man and God. So it tries to explain this through the rational method, not only based on the Hadith or Quran. Uh, Muslims, when they wanted to explain their belief and to justify, mostly they used also the philosophy which uh, uh, they have borrowed many of these teaching also from the Greek philosophy. So in fact in general we can say that the philosophical movement started from uh, Greek and came to uh, Persian Empire and then gone to Andalusia and later on from Indonesia to uh, West, which is, uh, they normally they say uh, the mm, Renaissance mostly is uh, borrowed the uh, philosophical thinking from the uh, Andalusia. Some, many, many people believe like that. So it is a, like a circulation of the thought. It started from Greek and then uh, Eastern Mediterranean and then West, and then again came to Europe. In when the uh, philosophical thinking came to Muslim world, uh, some some Muslims like uh, Ibn, uh, like Ibn Sina and Farabi, they mostly emphasized on uh, reasoning and on philosophy. They didn't want <coughs> to mix it with the Islamic teaching. So in, in among the Muslim philosophers also, we have two groups. 
those people who used pure philosophy like Ibn Sina and Farabi and those people who used philosophy to justify <coughs> the Islamic belief which we call them Mutakallimin or uh, or uh, theologians so we, we have two different group who used uh, uh, philosophical reasoning so these two groups one is mixed with the Islamic teaching and another one was just emphasizing on pure philosophy so the philosophical thinking when it started in a uh, Muslim world they have first it was started by Al-Kendi and then followed by Farabi and then Ibn Sina so uh, Farabi and Ibn Sina were those people who didn't want uh, to mix Islamic teaching with philosophy much but the others they tried to use philosophy and philosophical reasoning to justify Islamic belief like Mu'tazile which uh, is one of them Islamic theology which I, I already I explained uh, they they try to justify Islamic belief by philosophical reasoning so here we can see that through this philosophical reasoning we will come to the Mu'tazila school of thought because to justify the Isla uh, Islamic belief they use rational method and the another and the other one, the Ash'ari school of thought, they were also theologian, which they opposed of using rational method to justify Islam, because they said it is a kind of mixing the Greek philosophy with Islam. They were not happy with this. So from here, uh, we can see there is a movement, too, a strong movement, especially <coughs> during the uh, Abbasid time. So during the Abbasid time, the Mu'tazile school of thought was very strong because it was backed by the uh, Abbasid. Uh, but later on, the Ash'ari school took power and also supported by the uh, establishment and governments. So they have lost their position in Muslim world. Here I just explained about the, the impact of political uh, politics on the philosophy. So already I told that during the um, Umayyad time, they tried to uh, support Ash Ali school of thought during the Umayyad time. But later on, uh, Abbasid supported the uh, philosopher so in fact it was a kind of shift also because normally when uh, the scholars were active in the court and in the government activities so normally when they engage themselves in one uh, government or one system or one dynasty when the system were changing to others one the new uh, people who came to the power, they didn't want to use the previous uh, scholars, Islamic scholars. So they used to come to the other uh, faction and the other movement. So because of that, uh, the, during the Abbasid time, they preferred to not to use the Ash'ari school of thought and ulamas and the scholars. They preferred to go to the philosophers and those people who use the uh, rational method because they were uh, they were not engaged in previous governments but uh, at the end of the uh, Abbasid period at the end of the Abbasid period the Abbasid also s started to support the Mu'tazila school of thought and later on uh, the Saljuris also Saljuris who uh, also uh, collapsed the 
uh, what is that uh, opposite uh, uh, dynasty so they also supported the uh, supported the Ash'ari school of thought and especially during this time when Fatimid also uh, took power in the uh, North Africa just I, I will try to finish uh, in North Africa so they used um, Muhammad Ghazali and Fakhr Razi and also Imam uh, al Haramin uh, uh, Jubaini. They collect all these people and they produce very good scholarly books uh, for madrasas. And through the madrasas, maybe it was it became like a, a network during the for the first time in the Muslim world. They it became like a network. That means during the Fatimid and during the, what is that, during the uh, 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 Saljuk and also Kharaz Shahiyan, these people uh, made a uh, web for the education because they were competing each other while the Saljuk and Kharaz Shahiyan, they used to support the uh, Ash'ari school of thought. The Fatimid and also the Fatimid uh, try to support and also Ismailis that means the Fat Fatimids uh, they wanted to they supporting the uh, philosophies so there was a competition in general between the uh, these political function uh, systems in North Africa and also in uh, East uh, part of the Mediterranean and uh, during this time also many uh, many students came from uh, Andalusia to eastern part of the uh, Muslim world, that means especially in the Persian area, to learn philosophy and also Sufism, which little by little it became very famous, which uh, since I don't have my time, I will try to uh, explain that uh, during this time, Many books of uh, Imam Ghazali were, uh, were taught in most of the part of the Muslim world, and especially when the Salah uh, Salahuddin uh, also took power after the Fatimid. So in general, uh, uh, when the, uh, during the, after, after Salahuddin, Salahuddin Ayyubi, so when the, uh, it was the end of the Fatimid, so the whole areas, the, the, that means the uh, North Africa and also Persian uh, area, all became Ash'ari schools. So from that time, uh, even today, philosophy and the rational method is not taught in, uh, is, not teach, uh, is not taught in the madrasas. So even today in, uh, most uh, in almost all the madrasas in the Sunni school of thought, they they don't uh, teach philosophy or any method which is uh, based on the uh, rational method. And especially if they are Salafi, for example, like a Wahhabi, they are completely against using rational methods, and they are not happy with any. Even they are not happy with the Ash'ari school of thought. And they are not happy also even with Sufism. So uh, anyhow, after uh, the after North Africa controlled by the uh, Saladin Ayyubi, so the whole area from Iran, Pers uh, the Persian uh, area up to North Africa, all became as a school, or maybe some of them also. Uh, uh, emphasize on Sufism. But in Andalusia, the case was completely different. In general, mostly they were Maliki, and uh, they didn't allow to use any philosophical or rational method, or even Sufism, they didn't allow to be practiced in the Andalusia. So Andalusia was uh, completely independent that means within the uh, within the uh, competition in the thought, <coughs> Andalusia was independent. They didn't want to 
uh, take the Fatimids uh, side or for example the others, the Abbasid or maybe the Seljuks. They didn't want to, uh, to support any of this uh, thought. Mostly they were independent and they were mostly uh, uh, concentrate on Maliki uh, fiqh, but they didn't want to use any uh, of philosophy or Sufism and they used to burn even the books of the of uh, Muhammad Ghazali and these people. And uh, at last, I want to come to this conclusion. Although the in, in although we can see that uh, government and policy did not support it, the philosophical thought and also the Sufism in the Andalusia. But we have very good scholars they have produced, which uh, the last one is Ibn Rushd, which was very famous in the, uh, in the history of Muslim uh, philosophy. He, was, he is a very famous person, Ibn Rushd. And also, they have produced also another person, very famous person, uh, philosophical Sufi, Ibn Arabi, which he also become very famous. So at last, uh, in the last period of the Andalusia, they produced two important people. One in philosophical Sufi, which is Ibn Arabi, and another one is Ibn Rushd. So these two people, in fact, even today, they have great uh, impact on uh, philosophy and in Sufism in Muslim world. These two people who produced uh, by Andalusia. They, they, both of them are Andalusians. So at the first stage, they received information and knowledge, and finally they have produced great call, uh, scholars like Ibn Arabi and like uh, uh, Ibn Rush, which today also they have a lot of influence on uh, philosophy and Sufism in the Muslim world. Thank you so much for <laughs>